All right, welcome back to Fast Gadgets. So this video is definitely something different than my usual videos. So if you do not want to do a hands-on tutorial or you're not interested in Microsoft Access 2013 or 2016, um, you can skip this video. For those of you who are interested in learning how to use Microsoft Access, uh, this video will be a two or three part series. I'm not quite sure yet. It depends how long the video goes. Um, but I am going to walk you through the creation of a Microsoft Access database, which will include the tables, uh, the relations between the tables, reports, queries, um, pretty much everything having to do with Microsoft Access. Um, if you are curious, I am going to be following through on a book. It's the Microsoft Office 2013 Introductory. Um, and it's part of the Shelley Cashman series. Um, if you have an interest in Access and you have 2016, this tutorial will work just as well with 2016. The only difference will be there may be um, some tools on the ribbon that are in slightly different places, but otherwise, whether you're on Access 2013 or 2016, this will work just fine. The tutorial I'm going to go through is designed for you to actually follow with me, so it's best if uh, you pause now and get your computer and bring Access up, because you're going to want to walk through with me as I go through Access. Uh, this system here is Windows 8.1 with Microsoft Access 2013. You can use um, pretty much any version of Windows, Windows 7 and up, I believe, with 2013. Uh, so it doesn't really matter which version of Windows you're using, uh, as long as it's Access 2013 or newer. So I want to talk a little bit about databases in general first. Uh, the first thing to know about databases is that although this program access is a database tool, um, it creates something more than a single table database. It actually creates databases that are called relational databases. And what relational databases are, are many tables um, in the database that relate together. So as an example, I may create a table uh, with my employee information and then I may have a table that relates to it that is the zip codes for example and then I could just select a zip code in my main table if I related the two tables together. So let's bring up a blank desktop database. So this particular database, I'm going to change the name to Bavent Publishing. And it's currently going to save in C Users Mark Documents, which is the default location for a database to save, which is perfectly fine. So I'm going to do Create. And you'll notice that right from the beginning a table is created and we have the very first record here which looks very similar if you think about it to a spreadsheet but don't be deceived this is much different than a spreadsheet okay so when you look in a table of a database each row is considered a record and it will become more apparent as we build the table um, so try to get used to the fact that a single row is a record. So as an example, we could have last name, first name, phone number, address, and so on. And then we would enter all the information for a single user. And this would become that user's record. We have a column here that's called ID. So... Uh, Actually, these are called fields in a database, not columns. Columns are something that are used in spreadsheets, but we're actually doing a database. So this first field in the database contains 
ID. And this is a automatic unique identifier that's generated every time you add a record. For this tutorial we are going to disable the automatic generation because we have some support files that we're going to use. Uh, but normally you could just leave the automatic unique identifier turned on in access. This is also called the primary key in the table. So one way to think of this particular field is as a unique identifier but most people when you are talking about databases are going to call it a primary key. So they may ask what is the primary key of the table? And what they basically mean is which field in this table will give us an absolutely unique identifier for that person. If you think about social security numbers those are unique identifiers. Only you have your social security number. So the primary key of the table with your record information in it in the government database is the social security number. So what do we want to accomplish today? Well today we're going to create a table. We're going to add some records in. Um, we will work on importing records we'll work on modifying a second table that we're going to add and part of that modification is to import records we're going to create a query several actually we'll create some forms that can be used to enter data and we're going to create a report so now that we have access running I'm going to go ahead and go full screen with access and we basically have already created the database so we already have the database open here and there's a couple of different items that we're going to be using quite frequently one is the view so if I click the drop down triangle which is this tiny triangle pointing down beneath view I'm currently on data sheet view but I can just as easily change it to design view and you'll notice that when I change it to design view it automatically wants to know what I want to name the table. Now there's several different things we could call it. It really doesn't matter what you name the table. Um, for the sake of this particular tutorial I'm following the book that I have and I'm gonna call this table book rep. So if I click OK we can now see the design view which we'll be using more a little bit later. I can click view again and I can select data sheet view. I also can click this button here as a toggle and switch back and forth between design view and database view. Okay so we talked about the fact that the primary key is actually uh, generated automatically and we're going to come back to that in a minute because we're going to change it. When you name fields, keep in mind that you cannot have a field in Access that is longer than 64 characters in length. Um, it cannot contain periods, exclamation points, accent graves which is usually on the keyboard next to the numeral one key and above the tab key uh, or square brackets which are the keys that are next to the letter P typically on the keyboard and they are the lowercase. Every field in a database and these are fields must have a unique name so if we call this one last name we can't have a field over here also called last name. And we want to determine what we're going to make the primary key. So we're actually going to modify this primary key because we really don't want access in this particular table to automatically create the primary key. So if I right click on the ID field, I can tap or click rename. Depends if you have a touch screen, that's why I say tap or click. 
and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rename this particular field book rep number and then I'm gonna tap or click one time in the white space below the name of the field and the reason I say click one time if you don't you'll begin creating a record and if you do that it's somewhat difficult to delete it it is possible uh, but it is somewhat of a pain so you want to click only as one time in the white space below it to make the number save now we want to change the data uh, from auto number which is what access does and our logic behind this is because this particular company that we're building this particular database for already has unique identifiers for its employees so they would like to put in their own number for a unique identifier in other words this table is going to contain employee information so what we'd like to do is change this particular field so I still have book rep number highlighted and I'm gonna go up to data type and data type is located in the formatting group if I go to data type I'm gonna choose short text now notice the field size is 255 characters well we really don't want to leave the field size as 255 characters because it gives us more opportunity to make a mistake and as it happens this company Bavent Publishing only has a book rep number of two digits now depending on how many employees a company would have it's unlikely that they would only have two digits but for the case of this particular tutorial I'm gonna set the field size to two characters so I put two characters in field size and press enter and it will allow me to save the field with two characters only okay the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to rename the name of this particular well actually I should say we're gonna change the caption so on the fields tab with book rep number highlighted we have the option name and caption if I click name and caption the name of the field is book rep number and caption is basically shorthand for that particular field so this is quite a bit of text to actually display so I'm gonna change it to just a few terms a few letters I should say and then I'm gonna describe what exactly is in this particular field so I'll just put a brief description the name of the field will be book rep number the caption is BR pound sign and the description is unique identifier of book rep so when I press OK you'll see that my caption or display has changed to book rep number now I've got some more field names that I want to create if I click to the left excuse me to the right of book rep number I can click to add and the data type that I'm going to use for this field will be short text and I'm going to put last name if I click next to it actually before I click next to it since I've changed it to last name again I can decide what field size I want and for the sake of this particular database they have us go with 15 characters um, 
if I was doing last name or first name in an, a production database, I would certainly consider making it longer than that because 15 characters is pretty short. I can do click to add and I can do short text again and I can put first name and change the value here again to 15 was it and start here so on field 2 I'm going to do a rename field you'll notice that the field names did not stick uh, the reason being is because I tried to change the field size and the name at the same time so if I click rename I can rename this to last name and then I'll click over here and right click and do rename field first name and then I'll click to the next one and I'm going to do street which is short text and then my next table I'll do short text and I'll type city I mean my next field not table my next field I'll do short text again and I'm gonna do state and then my next field zip and then my next one I will do salary and on my next one I'll do short text again and I'm going to type in bonus rate and if I click anywhere else it'll automatically save bonus rate now bonus rate actually needs to be a type of number and I want to show you that you can change it after the fact here on the fields tab if I click this drop down I can actually change it to a data type of number and now bonus rate is showing zero because nothing has been entered yet and I'm gonna go ahead and click the save button I do like to save frequently just in case something goes wrong with our database. I'm going to restore the database because I have a graphic here. So I'm going to move this up. And I want to show you, I've got a couple of different things here. One is this graphic, <coughs> which has uh, the names of each of the tables as well as their data types and the field sizes and any notes that may appear in them. Now before I do any changes here you'll see that I've actually missed the start date so I'm gonna go ahead and do click to add and this one I'm going to select date and time and I'll type in start date and then I'll click once in the white space below it. So now I have start date, bonus rate, salary, zip, state, city, street, first name, last night, last name, and book rep number. And I have the table here so that I can follow through and make changes to the field sizes. So if I click last name, it does have a field size of 15 so it did take the change from earlier if I click last name again it has a field size of 15 if I click street for the sake of Bavent Publishing's database I'm gonna change it to 20 characters but again in a production database that may be too short then I'll click city and again I'm going to go with 20 characters and then state 
In the case of state, we're going to use uh, abbreviations, so we only need two characters. With the zip, normally it's a nine digit number, but this particular database is only going to use five. So depending on how you want to enter your zips, um, if you're going to use the full zip code, it would be nine characters. Then we have salary, and since we know that the salary type is currency, I'm going to go ahead and change the type to currency now. Start date, we have a type of date, and we do have many different form formats we can use. And let's see, we can do pretty much any type. We'll just leave it alone and see what it comes out as. So we've now successfully changed the type and the size of each one of our fields. So I'm going to press save again. We still have a little bit more to do. Because some of these are unique, okay? So let's change to design view. So we can see a lot more information in design view. Um, there's two significant changes that we need to make. If you go look at bonus rate, it has a data type of number but a field size that is single with a format that is fixed with two decimal places. So let's see if we can do that. So if I go down to bonus rate and I've highlighted the bonus rate and it's a type of number. Right now its field size is long integer. If I click anywhere in this box I'll get a drop down and I can click the drop down and I can change its field size to single and you'll understand why we're doing this in just a minute. Um, this is basically going to be a decimal or percentage of salary uh, that the staff member gets when they get a raise. And our decimal type, remember there was two instead of auto so we'll change that to two. And its format is fixed. Right here. Format fixed. So our field size is single, format is fixed, decimal place is 2, default value 0. Alright, now, is there anything else we need to change while we're in here? Let's look at our sizes. Book rep number is 2, last name is 15, First name, 15. Street is 20. City is 20. State is 2. Zip is 5. Salary is type of currency in format. And decimal places is auto. Bonus rate, single, fixed, two decimal places. And start date. Now, if you had to, uh, you could make a field larger once you've already entered data into a database, but for the most part you do not want to change a field size after the database has been created, especially if you're going to shrink the field size. If you shrink the field size, it's possible that you could lose information. Case in point, um, if we had a field size of 9 and we were using 9 digit zip codes and the field size was changed to 5, we would definitely lose uh, 4 digits of the zip code at that point. I'm going to save one more time and then I'm going to toggle my view again to database view. So we have all the fields correctly created with this particular table we need to enter new information. I have another graphic that I'm going to bring up of some records that I'm going to enter. 
So there aren't too many records for this one, but you do need to see how to enter records into a table. So I'm going to move the bottom of this app up access so that you can see the graphic at the same time. So I'm going to start here. So I'm going to enter in the first book rep which is number 53 and you can click to the next field but in this case I'm just gonna type the tab key and I will keep hitting the tab key to enter the field information tab is the quickest way to get through when you're entering records and to reduce the likelihood of making a mistake. And their bonus rate is 0.19 and start date is 26,250. Whoops, I totally have that backwards, don't I? I got the salary right. I'll clear out start date. The format type, of course, is date and time, so it says this is not an accurate date and time. Okay, and when I pressed enter on the very last field, it automatically took me to the beginning of the next record. So for this one, I'll enter 42 and Perez, Molina. Porter Drive, I went one field too far, Adelphia, Pennsylvania, $31,500 is the salary, bonus rate 0 0.2, and date 5-14-2000. 12. And again, I'm going to press enter here. And tab to go to the next field. Tab again. Simpson Drive. Pleasantburg. 07025 salary 29,000 bonus rate 0 0.2 start date 1 2013 I'll press enter again and I'm going to enter the last record just using the tab key to go between each field Salary 7050, bonus rate 0.18, and start date 7-1-2014. And I'll go ahead and press save again. Now we have the start date here, but if we really wanted to, we could move start date over so notice the thick black line so let me explain how I'm doing that so basically what I'm doing is I'm moving the mouse until I see the small white mouse and then I'm clicking and holding the left mouse button and if I drag it to the left wherever the line ends up the table will be dropped excuse me the field will be dropped to the right of the previous field so if I let go start date is now in front of salary and bonus rate just like the sample table we have here and if you notice I have a typo here databases are only as accurate as the information entered 
So it's very important to review the information you enter and then ensure that you have everything correct. So I'll click save one more time and I'm going to close this table. Now watch what happens when I double click it and reopen it. Notice that sorting is now by book rep number, lowest number to highest number. In other words, sort ascending. We can actually change it to sort descending if we wanted to. We could do multiple sorts, so we could have a sort on one column and then another column. But usually, instead of doing sorting in the table, we save that for queries, which we're going to talk about later on, on part two of this particular tutorial. Okay, so we've entered all the information in the tables. We've saved the database and we've added all the records that we were going to add for this particular table. Now we could do, I'm going to go back to full screen, a file and print and we can look at print preview to get an idea of what our printout would look like and we could change it to landscape mode um, we could change margins if we wanted to it looks like everything fits right now on one page um, so depending on the size of the table it may or may not fit on one page so typically you save your printing for reports or queries but I did want to show you that and of course we can just exit print preview and we go right back to the database itself. All right. For this step, what I would like to do is import uh, an Excel uh, table. Now, you, you probably will not have access to this particular table that I'm going to import. Basically, we can import data whether it is text or an Excel spreadsheet. And in this case, I have a file here that is in an Excel spreadsheet and it is our customer data. Alright, so we've opened up the Excel spreadsheet and you can see that we have all the information in sheet view but we would like to import this into the database as a customer data table so we're gonna do just that and there's a couple things that you have to be careful of. because we want to create a relation between the customer data <clears throat> and the book rep table while we do the import and we do some changes it's very important to ensure that we keep certain fields and in this case the book rep number the same in both tables so I'm gonna go ahead and do an import so if I click back to home and then click external data I have some options here I can import a spreadsheet I can import an access database I can import a different type of database one that might be from a SQL server uh, I can use a text file I can use an XML file you will commonly see XML or text files being exported from another database program such as a SQL server structured query language server or some other uh, database program um, but there are many different import options and you can see here we can actually do exports as well and we can export data. If you imagined a database with tens of thousands of records and you were moving, let's say two companies were merging and you had to move your database with 10,000 records over to the new company's database more than likely you would be exporting it as text or Excel or XML because it would be much more easier to export and import into the new database than it would be to recreate all those records manually. 
So in this case, I'm going to click Import Excel Spreadsheet. It's going to say, where will we find this document? So I will do Browse. And the document I'm going to use is the Customer Data Spreadsheet. And I will try to provide a link for this in uh, the description of this video. I should be able to get you a link for that, and we'll do that. And I'm going to import the source data into a brand new table. So I don't want to import it into a current table. So I'll click OK. <clears throat> now notice that it's quite smart. It says, does the first row contain the column headings? And in this case, yes, it does. So we're going to leave that setting the same, and I'll click Next. It says you can specify information about each of the fields you're importing. In this case, everything is relatively accurate, so I'm just going to leave it the way it is for right now. And I'll click Next. Now this is important. Here's why. It wants to know, do you want access to add a brand new primary key or should you choose your own primary key? And in the case of this particular database, uh, in the, for Bavent Publishing, they create manually their own customer numbers. If this were a really large database, um, say it was for um, an e-commerce site like Walmart and they had millions of part numbers, it's probably best to auto-generate the number to ensure that there's never a duplicate. But in the case of this database, it is okay to say, no, I want to choose my own primary key. It just so happens that Access again takes a guess and says, it seems to me like you would want this particular field. Why? Because the other ones here are text. This one happens to be one of the only ones that contains unique information. As a matter of fact, it might be the only one in this entire table. It is. So Excel's pretty smart at, excuse me, Access is pretty smart at looking at um, the spreadsheet to be imported and determining which of the fields has a unique number. And remember, in order to be the primary key, every single record number must be unique. They cannot have any duplicates. So I'm going to click Next. It says, what do you want to call this? Now you can change it to whatever you want. Um, we're going to change this to Customer Number instead of Customer Data. And I can click Finish. If I think I'm going to be doing this import frequently, I could save the import steps. Keeping in mind, if I save these current steps, it would always create a new table. So that's one thing to consider. So I will click Close at this point. And again, at this point, now that I have the customer number table, I'm going to save and now I have two tables here. Notice that the book rep table is still open, which I could close now, but I want to show you if I actually opened the customer number table, I now have two tables open. So I can click back to customer uh, book rep, and then I can click back to customer number. There's a couple of changes that we do want to make. So I'm going to go to customer number and on the home tab I'm going to change view to design view. Let's see what changes we should make. Let's click customer number and in the description, we're going to add a description. Customer number, because we manually create this customer number, we need to specify the rules we're going to use for anybody who may be using the database. So we're going to say three 
numbers, excuse me, three uppercase letters followed by two digit number. And remember, this is just optional information for anybody who happens to come in and use the database. All right. So let's check out customer name. And you can see that customer name is a type of short text, which is perfectly fine. Actually, I'm going to go back one more. Let's look at customer number. Short text is fine, but field size is definitely too long. So if somebody were typing in the name, they could make an error, which would cause, say, an extra digit or two or three, or even the space character, which is blank. Well, it's empty. You can't see it, but it's really there. So we want to limit the field size on customer number to five characters. If we look at customer name, we're going to use short text, which we already have selected, but we're going to change the field size to 30. And then if we go to street, we're going to leave it as short text and we will change the field size to 20. City, we will continue to use short text, field size of 20. State, Again, just like our other table, two character maximum because we're going to use the abbreviation for state. Postal code will change to five. Amount paid, we're going to leave it as it is, which is type currency. Current due is type currency. Returns is type currency and finally book rep number we need to change this to two because the book rep number is going to relate to book rep number in our other table and that's going to be the link between our two tables and that's going to be what makes this a relational database and i'm going to put a description here as well book rep number number of book rep for customer and we are going to change the caption so I can actually change the caption right here if I click in caption I can do BR pound just like we did in the other table and I'll just have a quick check customer name field size 30 street field size 20 city field size 20 and I'm only single clicking on each of these fields field size for state 2 postal code field size 5 currency for amount paid we'll leave the format alone currency for current due we'll leave that alone currency for returns and book rep number field size is 2 before I leave table, uh, design view, I'm going to save. Now, here was the message I was referring to you before. Some of the field sizes were 255 characters, and we have changed them to a shorter size. Access is warning us. If you do this, you could lose data if the information in the fields is longer than the size you are limiting your field to. We're not concerned about that <clears throat> because we actually know that the data in the database will be okay. But it's always wise before you cut field size to check the field and see what the longest piece of data is in the field. So it's okay to say yes in this case. If you've had a database you've been running for a long time, it's not advisable to change the field size smaller without first backing up the database. Alright, now I can change over to sheet view. And we have two tables with our data entered. 
and I would like to create a basic query just so you can see what we can do with the data in the second part and third part of this series I'm gonna show you some very complicated queries you can do to pull information from the database keep in mind that what we're looking at right now is just data so it's not really very helpful is it it basically is just a whole bunch of data but we want to turn it into useful information right so that's the whole purpose of these queries so I'm gonna show you a really basic query that we can do so I'm gonna go ahead and click Save and what I want to do at this point is go to the Create tab and I'm going to use for this particular query the query wizard and if I click the query wizard it asks me which one would you like to use in this case I'm only gonna do a simple query so I'll click OK then it wants to know what table do you want to use and the table I'm going to use is going to be the customer table and I can actually select which fields I would like to add to this particular query so in this case I'm going to add customer number I'm gonna click the greater than arrow to add one field at a time if I wanted to I could add all of them at once by clicking this button and all the fields would be added to the query but I don't want all of them okay this query is going to be a little more basic so what I am going to add is the customer number customer name and then I'll click amount paid on the left side and I'll click the greater than current due and I'll click greater than again returns and I click greater than again and book rep number so we don't really need the address or street or any of that information uh, what would we use this query for well you could use it for all kinds of things so if I click next it says do you want detail or summary in this case we do want detail if you do not click detail summary will only show uh, computations or totals for amount paid we don't want that we want to see every record in this case so I'll click next and when I do that <clears throat> it'll say once we create this query what would you like to do and I'm gonna shorten this so it's called the customer query and I do not need to modify the design so I'll click finish now notice I now have book rep customer number which are tables and a customer query which has a different icon so it looks like two tables intermingled now if say for example a supervisor wanted to know um, give me a list of all the customers ordered by return starting from largest to smallest so what they're trying to determine here is what customers are returning the most amount of uh, items books to our company for their orders so we've resorted this particular query so that it so sorts largest to smallest okay so I'm gonna close the query it says do you want to save unsaved changes and the unsaved changes were my resort I'm gonna say no and I'm gonna go ahead and double click and reopen that query now what if I wanted specific information from the query 
Well, I could do that too. If I want to, if I click back on the Home tab, much like a table, I can go to Design View. And I can actually enter criteria. Case in point, what if I wanted to go down to Book Rep Number? Here on criteria for book rep number, I could say show me all customers who use our employee or book rep number 53. And remember, a book rep number is simply a number for an employee. So it's the identifier, the unique identifier for that particular employee. And right from the design view, I can actually click run <clears throat> and it will run that table for me and now I can see all of the customers who are using book rep number or employee number 53 and I can see all of their returns current due amount paid which shows me to some extent what types of performance I'm getting from that particular employee so it's actually really useful. So we are not going to save this query because if we did save it, every time the query was run, it would only show book rep number 53. If I really did want to save that, I would do save as, save object as, and then save as again and it says okay what do you want to save this customer query to well it by default says copy of customer query but I might short it to customer for book rep number 53 and then okay doesn't look like it likes the name. Oh, I think it's because I have the period in there, so we'll take the period out. There we go. So now I've got customer for book rep 53 and customer query. <clears throat> so if I close this query, we still have the original customer query. And I'll close that one. And now we have customer for book rep number 53. This is useful if you want to have a query or a report open and it's already all set up for a supervisor. This particular supervisor may oversee two or three employees, one of which is book rep number 53 and they only are interested in seeing what their uh, employee is doing. Now another thing that we can create is a form. A form is a good way of entering information uh, if you want to limit what an employee can enter as far as new records go. <coughs> so I'm going to close all my tables and I'm going to go back to create and I'm going to select form. Now by default Oh, my mistake. You notice when I created the form, I was still highlighting the query customer for book rep number 53. Well, unfortunately, when I did that, it limited information in the form to that query. So I'm going to close this. I am not going to save it. <clears throat> and I'm going to select the customer number table. And while I'm here, I'm going to right click and I am going to rename and shorten it to just customer. Now with customer highlighted, if I go to create form, I actually now have a form now keep in mind I'm not at the point yet where I can enter data this is just the recommended form size and what will be included in the form so if I go to close this particular form 
It's going to ask if I want to save the form. I'll say yes. And we'll just call the form name customer. With form, there's a couple different things we can do. One, if I double click on this, I now can flip through and see I have one of 15 records. So I can flip through and click through each of the records. I can go to the last record. I even could create a new record if I wanted to. I also could edit and change one element of one record. Now back when I was in design view, if I wanted to, I could remove certain fields that I don't want employees to be able to enter, such as amount paid, current due, or returns. So we could create a special form that only certain employees could use to enter limited information if we wanted to. So forms are really useful for entering data or viewing a record one at a time. So if I click the close, there's nothing to say because we didn't actually make any changes. All right, the next thing I would like to do is create a basic report. So let's go ahead and create a report. Now, much like the query, we really do first want to select the customer table prior to creating the report. Then I'll click on the Create tab. And then I'm going to click since we don't have a wizard, basically just report. And we automatically have created a report based on the customer table. Now keep in mind we're in design view right now. So I can go ahead and click save. And it'll say, what do you want to name this particular report? I'm going to call it customer financial report and I'll click OK and it automatically shows the report here in my list of reports now depending on who's going to use this report we may not really need to have all of this information in here so why don't we make some changes First of all, if I double click the label, I can change the name to Customer Financial Report. And you'll notice that it's going to get a time date stamp every single time that it runs. <clears throat> so we have a couple of extra fields here that we don't need. For one thing, before I get rid of any fields, why don't I change customer number to something a little bit more manageable? Customer unique number. And I'll press enter and it'll save that for me. So if I'm not already on the Arrange tab. I'm going to click the Arrange tab and I'm going to select Select Column. And if I press the Delete key, I can delete these columns. So I'm going to delete all of the address information. I'll press the Delete key on the keyboard. I'll click State. I could hold down the shift key as well and do state and postal code and then select column. So now I've actually selected two and I can delete those as well. So now my report will actually fit all on a single page. I'm going to press save just to make sure I've saved the information. If we want to we can also change the field sizes. So if I move between the different fields, when my mouse is in between both of them, I can actually shrink the size of a particular field. So I'm clicking and holding the mouse and I can move it over. 
and I can change the size of fields as necessary. Uh, book rep I can shrink down and then I can press save again and if you look down here at the bottom this particular line here is slightly cut off so I'm going to enlarge this just a little bit so that I can see the entire number now I do have a total for returns but I don't have a total for current due and amount paid so let's change that in this particular database or excuse me this particular report so if I click the amount paid heading and then go to the design tab there's an option here to produce a total so if I click totals I can select sum and it will actually place in the total there for me. I can do the same exact thing for current due. I can again click totals and then sum and now I have a total for current due as well. So I'll click save one more time and I'll close this particular report and then I'm going to double click the report again to open it and if I click file and print on this particular report I can do a print preview and I can actually see that the report is much nicer looking and fits much better on the single page and it includes our totals if we wanted to we could change the sort order so it's by returns and it could be descending or current due or amount paid or whatever we really need to see Current due would be outstanding monies that need to be paid. Um, amount paid would be what they've paid so far. And returns would be money that probably would need to be processed when the books come in. So either way. So now I can click close print. And I can close the customer financial report. This will conclude part one of our tutorial. Now I am going to continue on in part two and we're going to create some very customized um, queries uh, and reports and you want to be here to see that. So please like and subscribe and stay tuned to my channel and I'll be showing you some of those features that we can create which have some very nice reports. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on part two.